Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the nth lecture of the semester. And uh, we are in for a treat today. I know we don't have California weather today, but we do nevertheless have a California lecture. And I'll let Josh talk more about that uh, in a moment. But I just wanted to uh, welcome you all. I am Mahesh Das, a Chair of Architecture, as you all probably know. And uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to the lecture. Uh, and the, by the way, don't forget that next week, next Monday, we have uh, another exciting lecture uh, from Anijo Matthew from Illinois Institute of Technology, blurring the boundaries between urbanism, industrial design, and such. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but without uh, further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Josh Cogershaw, uh, who's part of our uh, exciting lecture committee. Uh, he and uh, Tim Gray and Andrew Witt have done a great job of uh, putting together this wonderful series. So take it away, Josh. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for showing up. Um, Natalie is a founding design partner of Future City Labs, which she uh, collaborates with Jason Kelly Johnson. We used to have a different Jason Johnson here. Um, she, uh, well, I'll just read a little bit. Um, working in collaboration with her partner, J partner Jason, Natalie's produced a range of award-winning projects exploring the intersections of design with advanced fabrication technologies, robotics, responsive building systems, and public space. Um, she's also the chair of the graduate program at California College of Arts in San Francisco. Um, she's part of a really great emerging scene that's happening in San Francisco. Um, uh, actually really kind of jealous sitting where we are, uh, seeing what's going on there. Um, uh, she has taught at University of Virginia, University of Michigan, and now, uh, like I said, at, at CCA. Um, and with that, I just want to welcome her. Oh, first of all, she also spent the day with us and our students. Uh, it was really great to hear her comments. And, uh, criticism all day. Um, really thankful for that stuff. So um, thank you. Welcome. Can you guys hear me? I'm looking at the two people who are supposed to wave me down if that's not the case. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you, uh, Josh, and thank you, Mahesh. It's Thanks for inviting me and, and bringing me all the way here. Um, thank you to Lindsay and Lauren who drove in the snow to get me and bring me here. Um, and it was also, it's also been great kind of meeting Andrew, James, and a number of students today, um, kind of hearing the work that you're doing and also um, getting to know the school and, and what you guys have been up to. There's some really exciting things going on here. So um, it's been exciting to be part of like one day in the life of. Um, so um, I wanted to give you a little bit of context of um, Future Cities Lab, who we are, what we do, um, and I only have uh, a, a kind of smaller number of projects that I'd like to go uh, kind of more in depth in, and hopefully that can trigger some questions and conversation at the end um, or afterwards. Um, but we are a, a, a small design firm uh, working out of Dogpatch in San Francisco. Uh, so that's the kind of um, eastern waterfront. We're basically facing Oakland um, and Berkeley on the other side of the bay. So uh, we're a small design, um, a design firm. We would like to think that we're a small experimental design firm. Um, we are all architects in training. Um, both Jason and myself have architecture degrees as our kind of backbone, and most of the people who've worked through our, um, our design practice um, have kind of architecture as their main, let's say, um, kind of degrees kind of coming in. However, we do collaborate with a number of people who are coming um, to architecture, either from allied fields or even from completely disparate environments, like computer science, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. We share our office space with, um, it's kind of like a large uh, office space that we have, let's say, 50% of. Um, we have a kind of large fabrication shop and a kind of fabri digital fabrication space. But then we share that with a uh, design and kind of brand strategy company, an industrial designer, a photographer, graphic designer. So there's this kind of really interesting mix of people who come through the space, whether it's to meet with us or someone else. Um, and there's some kind of really interesting, let's say, 
um, kind of uh, conversations that happen across the conference table at kind of different times of the different times of the day. Um, for those of you who've looked through our portfolio, we work at multiple scales, right? So we've there, you may think that there's a little bit of a schizophrenic thing going on in the work in terms of working on the one hand from kind of installation and kind of pavilion scale to let's say smaller scale of like gallery, museum, uh, museum scale work to let's say a kind of much more speculative scale uh, proposals that uh, push the boundaries and maybe kind of uh, try to um, uh, energize and kind of uh, ourselves and the kind of process of, of designing and thinking, but then also kind of work through um, kind of, uh, let's say, much more speculative and utopian projects. So uh, today I'll, I'll show a little bit of both um, and maybe talk a little bit about what the common threads or the certain kind of ideas that we see kind of moving through, uh, moving through these. But I did want to kind of go through maybe a couple of ideas that you'll see trickling through the, the work and kind of a couple of thoughts that, um, let's say, we discuss and debate quite a bit um, in the office. Uh, we're really interested in exploring the relationship and potentials that exist in, um, in the natural and the artificial, the physical and the digital, the human and the machine. So these kind of this plus that, this plus that, the kind of mixing of things that are usually, let's say, kind of uh, kept apart. We don't see these as, let's say, binary conditions, but we actually see those as kind of symbiotic, um, symbiotic qualities that actually coexist with one another and actually mutually inform uh, one another. Um, so we're interested in exploring the interdependent inter kind of um, relationship between the things that we build, the things that we prototype, the things that we test, um, and also the things that surround us. So, the fact that our buildings, our artifacts, our installations, our galleries, our pavilions are continually kind of existing in reciprocal relationship with the things that surround them, with the environment, be it weather, climate, with people moving through a building, with um, sound coming in from a kind of urban context or uh, data being fed through Twitter. That there is this constant kind of ability of our surrounding environments to, uh, to have a kind of formal and well, I, we would like to hope formal, but also, let's say, spatial relationship with, um, with the things that are actually kind of triggering those. Um, so I wanted to kind of share with you a couple of projects, but I also wanted to start with probably the first project that Jason and I collaborated on. This is like going back into the archive. It's not our thesis project, thesis students who I just talked to. But, um, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a project that we started uh, where we kind of started our initial kind of collaboration. And the reason why I kind of bring this, bring this up is because I, I wanted to kind of share with you where some of those ideas kind of emerged and how do they actually kind of um, still, hopefully, you guys will be a better judge to tell me, that some of those ideas still exist in, in the work that we're actually doing today and that some of the questions are probably very, very kind of um, similar. So, Super Galaxy was a project that really kind of pushed this idea of the reciprocal relationship between a building and its environment by basically saying, what if we completely, what if we were actually able to kind of question the, the typical airtight, sealed tower? Like, what would actually happen if we took the skin off of an existing tower? Um, what if we actually allowed the weather to exist in the interior of a building that is, let's say, um, entirely sealed. Um, so we kind of basically displaced three floors from uh, Trump Tower. We just picked picked a tower, one that looked ominous and kind of dark and uh, completely, let's say, um, disconnected from its surroundings, um, and and kind of tried to understand what the latent energies, the latent forces that surrounded that site and that building um, could be, how we could harness them, but ultimately kind of displacing. Um, three floors and completely infiltrating the 52nd to 55th floor of Trump Tower. Um, and kind of embedding within it um, a housing colony or a hotel for global nomads. Um, this was in response to a housing competition. We didn't win the competition. <laughs> uh, but we took the, let's say, the parameters that the competition gave us as things to kind of push up against and things to kind of respond to in order to be able to kind of test some of the scenarios that we wanted to play through. So um, we basically kind of proposed a complete takeover of those three floors. Uh, we let the structure and the core to still kind of exist kind of running through it. And you can see the, 
the baby grand piano and the poodle above and below. Sorry, it's like, the, oh, I have a mouse. There we go. So you're seeing, let's say, the, the kind of dichotomy between like what would this kind of sealed environment above and below be, but then what would actually, what could take place in this, um, let's say, new garden or new public space that emerges up high um, as part of the elements. Um, and we work through kind of different scenarios of kind of understanding um, the kind of uh, sleeping or let's say living areas above and then the kind of public floor plate um, that you could, um, could coexist with the elements. Um, it would rain and kind of uh, wind would probably kind of course through it. But then we also kind of looked at going back to this kind of idea of the latent energies that surrounded it what would the, let's say, ability of wind patterns to kind of move through this, or let's say water to kind of be collected in certain kind of dimples and dips in that surface. So how could you actually kind of take advantage of, of certain conditions like optimal wind direction or let's say water collection to actually kind of become part of that constantly changing landscape. Um, so on the, on, on the left you're seeing a uh, what we call the wind gallery, which is kind of ground floor plan of that new public space. And then on the right, you're seeing an inverted ceiling plan of these kind of sleeping pods kind of um, sleep, uh, located up above. Um, and the other reason why I kind of like showing this project is that it was also a kind of initial set of ideas that we had about kinetics, kinematics, things that move, things that change, things that maybe evolve over time. So on the kind of lower half of this uh, slide, you're seeing a uh, the beginnings of our kind of, let's say, ambition that this surface up above would be one that could calibrate itself. So depending on the next incoming wind pattern or the incoming weather front, it would actually kind of recalibrate itself to create protected landscapes on the surface of, the, um, of this kind of new garden landscape. So we're kind of looking at kind of ways of actually activating that, um, that upper um, surface. Um, and here you're kind of looking into the wind gallery up above are the sleeping pods and the kind of living pods and then down below this kind of completely um, kind of open, um, open space. Um, we also started kind of looking at ways of actually um, thinking of surface and ground as not necessarily things that are entirely neutral, but in this case things that could have information on them. Um, here you're seeing the, let's say, the weather front that's making its way through. Maybe I had a kind of weather coming here, snowing, following a weather front across the country kind of <laughs> reason to put this first. But the idea here was that, you know, that surface could actually start registering other information. That the, let's say, our built fabric and the things that surround us could actually start giving us more information um, than what they currently are. Um, and this kind of leads to maybe a more recent kind of uh, speculative project that, um, that we've, we've done called Hydromax, which is a proposal for the San Francisco uh, waterfront. Um, and this is probably, let's say, one of the larger scale proposals that we had, um, that we worked on. It was a, a request, let's say, it was a, it was a commission a request by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art that we actually put our vision forward for what we, um, what we thought San Francisco's waterfront could be. Um, it's a territory that right now is being developed quite rapidly and changing quite a bit. So at the time it was a very kind of um, uh, hot topic. And for us, going back to these kind of ideas of super galaxy, right, so kind of looking at the surroundings and understanding how, what latent energies are actually kind of surround, um, let's say, a building, a project, an artifact, um, and how could you actually harness those to, um, to, be, to become part of the, of the design process? Working on the San Francisco waterfront and, and working with a city like San Francisco that is obviously well known for its microclimates, it's well known for its very variable weather, very changing kind of um, landscape. Here you're seeing the fog rolling in, which it will duly do this time of year. We call it the fog monster as it creeps over the hills from the ocean kind of into San Francisco and over to the bay. Um, so there's this kind of constantly kind of volatile environment that's around San Francisco. Um, and we, we saw that as, um, and, and sorry, in, in parallel to that, let's say, volatile environment, which is an atmospheric environment, there's also the kind of ecology and ecosystem of the bay, the San Francisco Bay, and you know, the, the fact that there are these pressures to grow into the bay, uh, kind of connect to the bay, but then also ultimately what is the impact of the water back into the city as well. Um, 
Right now, this is how we deal with the waterfront. For those of you who visited San Francisco, it's a hard edge, right? It's a very kind of, I mean, it's an Army Corps of Engineers, keep water out. Um, however, this is probably the edge that used to be, right? So right now, our impetus is to basically fortify our cities, keep water out, uh, build walls, build barriers. Um, but the question that we wanted to ask was, what would the opportunities be, design opportunities be, if we actually let the water in? So what would actually happen if we let the water actually kind of make its way through the, um, actually kind of break the wall and, and kind of address the opportunities post sea level rise? So once that would have actually kind of already, um, already happened. So what you're seeing on the left is, I don't know, is the project, yeah. So what you're seeing on the left, the, the gray is um, a kind of post um, sea level rise or uh, version of, um, of the um, San Francisco Peninsula. Um, and then on the right, you're seeing, let's say, our kind of vision of actually kind of embracing that and actually start, starting to think of a kind of re-networking of the bay um, through these Hydromax kind of piers that we were, um, we were proposing. So, um, so the Hydromax piers are basically kind of large infrastructural pieces the dot the edge of, of San Francisco, they, um, they're essentially kind of marshlands, let's say, when they hit land, but then they extend out as they, they basically take from a typical kind of pier typology. Um, and they kind of extend out into the water to become transportation hubs, uh, to become tra um, kind of new ways of kind of moving through the bay by water, so the city gets reoriented back to the water. Um, but then they also become large-scale food production and, um, and kind of large, large kind of spaces to kind of occupy either as public space or as, um, or as housing. So the idea for, um, the idea with Hydromax was that it was essentially an extension of the city, an extension of the city back out into the water, basically taking Folsom Street. For those of you who, so that's the Bay Bridge up above, uh, the Bay Bridge lands basically um, right by Folsom Street and kind of extending out uh, to produce a kind of completely different, um, let's say, network of uh, food, water, food production, water harvesting, um, and kind of um, market space. So what you're seeing up above is what we call the fog feathers. You guys will probably realize by the end of this lecture that a lot of our projects have pet names to different parts as we're kind of making them. So fog feathers stayed. Um, so the fog feathers up above where moisture from fog is condensed, so these fog feathers basically reach into the sky when an incoming fog bank comes in. Uh, moisture condenses on them um, and, and water basically kind of moves through this loop, is stored in this, in this truss. Um, it goes up to water the produce, water is then recirculated into a series of fish farms. Um, and then that water is basically recirculated back up to the gardens for irrigation. It's basically an aquaponics loop. It's like a backyard aquaponics loop taken and thought through as a kind of much larger scale, um, much larger scale infrastructural kind of urban piece. Um, so the idea with this is that basically the, the Hydromax would, um, would produce, would harvest, would farm, and then kind of disseminate back through, back to the rest of the bay through these um, through a kind of larger transportation network that would be embedded within it. Um, parallel to that, there's a kind of whole series of, like, let's say, tests that we ran for um, uh, different kind of options to this. So one would be that the fog feathers are actually fog feathers, produce, uh, basically capture water. Another would be if they were kind of solar panels, depending on which side of the bay you're on, because the microclimates are so different, um, or algae production. So um, or, or fuel production, essentially. So these kind of, let's say, things that are oriented to the sky could have multiple kind of versions to them as, as the project, let's say, migrated um, across the bay. And parallel to that, you'll see, like, in a lot of, let's say, the speculative work that we do, there is this kind of interest in pushing maybe a conversation about, about what public space could look like in that environment, what it could be like, you know, what is it like to basically be, like, waiting for your next boat ride, to like, to uh, across the bay next to a kind of uh, robotically harvested hydroponics farm. Um, so we're we're using our renderings to basically just vision vision forward, and it's it's more of a test for us to be able to kind of see 
how these pl what these places could be like and how these places could kind of um, evolve, but then also maybe start certain conversations about um, the role of speculation within the discipline. Um, one of the things that you'll also see with a lot of the speculative work is that we also try to test things out and prototype things in, in let's say, real kind of materials and in kind of physical form. So for the Hydromax project, you know, rendered this way, we were actually kind of working towards uh, a physical model. So actually, what you're, this is a render out of our fabrication model. So this is what our digital fabrication model looked like before it was kind of pulled apart and kind of um, uh, basically kind of uh, flattened, layered in order to basically produce the, the final kind of um, scaled architectural model. So this is an interactive model that was located at the San Francisco, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Um, and it, um, it was basically a um, 64th scale model of, of one of these piers um, that responded to um, people kind of moving around it in the gallery. Um, and I'll pull this, fingers crossed, as one always does when they play video. <laughs> Um, but I'm just going to jump a little bit forward to um, all of these videos are on Vimeo if you guys ever want to look at them again. Um, but these, um, so the, the project basically had a kind of whole series of uh, sensors around its edge. Uh, you can see the kind of black little cat eyes um, on, the, on the kind of uh, lower edge. Um, and as you would approach it, you're basically triggering the fog feathers to kind of move up into the, move up into the sky. Um, this was an entirely silent mechanism. It was uh, shape memory alloy motors were actually kind of running. I think you get a shot later on uh, from below where you can actually see the motors kind of uh, moving. But um, shape memory alloy is a, is a material that when current runs through it, its molecules change orientation. So if you think of a square that turns into a rhombus, that increases the distance by a certain kind of amount. Um, so that's the, um, so that kind of, let's say, extra length is what gives you the, um, let's say, the ability to, to kind of turn that into, essentially motorize it. Um, so for us, the need for, let's say, silence wasn't just like, oh, let's see if we can kind of do this without the ee -e 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 -e, which is the usual kind of motorized kind of um, scenario, but like it was also kind of a, there's an ephemerality to this. Um, yes, it's a large scale infrastructural kind of, let's say, proposal, but it also has like a certain kind of lightness to it, which we were trying to kind of um, work through. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing with this project is, and, and with a lot of the speculative projects that we've done, you know, everyone's like, oh, so, you know, is it your ambition that you're going to build one of these? And of course, we would love to, so if you know of anyone who wants a Hydromax in the backyard, let us know. Um, but it's also about kind of pushing the conversation forward and kind of um, allowing us to have a conversation, but then also this being, let's say, in a public museum, in a kind of public setting, allowing people to um, interact with it, kind of understand what it's doing, understand how it's actually responding, and then spark a conversation about climate, environment, post-sea level rise, I don't know, shape memory alloy motors, but, but that's kind of part of, let's say, our, um, our role as well in, in some of this. Um, what was interesting with uh, kind of working through this was that um, because of the, the height of the model, children were really able to kind of figure out how the thing worked because their eye height was like right in this interstitial space where they could actually see everything that was working. Um, and then, you know, the adults were basically trying to figure out what the sensors were, but the kids were like completely able to kind of um, understand it. And here you're seeing a kind of view into what, let's say, a typical, well, this is more of a charrette mode of our office looks like. I was going to say a typical, but that's... Um, but one, one thing that I do want to note is that we, all of the, especially for, for, the, for this particular model, all the electronics were done in-house. All of the fabrication happened in-house. In actually, we, this was the first time that we had some of our circuit boards. We designed them, but we actually had them made elsewhere. Um, but we're slowly, um, we're, we're still kind of completely invested in like making our own things. Um, the model was sewn together and hand-notched as part of our obsessive compulsive kind of probably layer uh, to our, um, let's say, characters. But, um, but there was something really kind of important to us to actually kind of making this really large thing appear as like super fragile as well. So there was something kind of um, really interesting in testing that out. So 
Um, here's this, just a couple of snapshots of us kind of working through the assembly of um, each one of these modules that basically made up the larger, um, the larger piece. Um, the next project that I wanted to go through is, um, and this is where like some of this, let's say, translation into installation work, um, I think is, has, has been really interesting for us to actually test out. So this kind of reciprocal relationship, let's say, between the um, a, a building, an artifact, a construct, and its environment um, was something that we really were interested in testing out at, let's say, a kind of digital information kind of layer. So how does, you know, one could argue that digital information is also another input in the things that, you know, if you were to think of it as an input-output relationship, these inputs could be environmental, climactic, and let's say those have been, to a certain extent, the, the more typical inputs to architectural design. But you know, what would actually happen if we considered data as another kind of input or as a, as a layer into, um, into our um, kind of um, habitable frameworks? Um, so Data Grove was a project that we did for the uh, San Jose Art and Technology Biennial. Um, and the, the kind of larger topic was seeking Silicon Valley. That was, the, let's say, the, the biennial's call. Um, and our <coughs> Excuse me. Our interpretation to seeking or finding Silicon Valley um, is that um, this is what Silicon Valley is to most of us. Um, you go there; it's a pilgrimage site for probably most people coming through. They want to go see Google. They want to see, you know, eBay, HP, Facebook. Like that's like the. But ultimately, that's what you get to. You get to the parking lot. Uh, you get to take a picture with a sign. Maybe if you know someone, you may have lunch in the cafeteria. Right, and that's, that's about the kind of layer of information that you're actually kind of able to get into. However, this is Silicon Valley, right? So the kind of larger call for the biennial of like seeking Silicon Valley for us was like, okay, so if this is Silicon Valley, how do you actually find um, Silicon Valley? So the, the data set that we kind of chose to work with was um, essentially Twitter feed, social media feed. So Silicon Valley to us was what people were talking about. It's like the water cooler conversations. Like, what are people reading, listening to, watching on TV, like talking about? And that became for us, let's say, the Silicon Valley that we wanted to find and wanted to, to portray. Um, so, I mean, here you can see basically the top, um, the top feeds, and here's let's say a kind of quick snapshot of what like one instance, one minute of one day, San Jose was kind of um, was let's say tweeting. Um, and we were able to, to basically kind of pull the top five feeds, um, the top five trending Twitter feeds at any time, um, and use that as the kind of information that Data Grove was actually speaking back at you. So this grove of information, or let's say the, like, what would have been the, the water cooler or the plaza um, fountain or the place where you go to get your gossip. I don't know what you all, uh, but the, the, that's the kind of, the data grove was basically kind of taking that on and, and providing you with that information. Um, so it actually kind of would re-hash um, or re-kind of transmit that information uh, back to a kind of urban setting. So for you to be able to kind of get the news of the day, you actually needed to be close to the grove in order to kind of hear what was going on. Um, and here's a kind of view of the installation in, in the courtyard space that we were given as part of the, as part of the biennial. Um, and we were seeing this as kind of essentially a kind of woven lattice, a lattice that could actually hold information. The materials that we used were um, acrylic, and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to show those maybe more clearly in a couple, yeah. So there was a kind of acrylic tubing and a kind of metal conduit material that were woven and kind of interwoven um, or woven into each other. Uh, the materials that we selected, especially metal conduit for us, was like A, it was cheap. Uh, B, it was also kind of the material that most of our information actually runs through, metal conduit. Um, and it's, let's say, a kind of pretty pervasive, um, pervasive material in our kind of built environments. And caught in this framework or caught in this web are these media pods. So these kind of glowing pink orbs that kind of retransmit that information back out at you. Um, so here you're seeing a kind of exploded axon of the base where all the electronics were housed, the kind of the, the pods and then the two lattices that intersect. Um, and here's the two materials as they're combined. Um, I'll show you a brief video. 
Have you heard about data growth by Future Cities Lab? There's a rumor about NASA Curiosity. Everybody's talking about the United Nations. Have you heard about Silicon Valley? Have you heard about X Factor? Have you heard about Silicon Valley? So what was interesting with just the kind of um, the installation itself is that the information that was being kind of transmitted back out at you was everything from like X Factor to the United Nations, right? So there was no control, like we were obviously not controlling what was being fed back out the system. So it was a completely, let's say, open-ended um, thing. But then there's also, there was also a kind of really interesting pattern that actually started emerging. Like, in the morning, it was all about like news and politics and things coming up. Middle of day, we suddenly got like a soap opera extravaganza, and then somehow towards the end of the day, it was news again, uh, sports and music later in the night. So because we were obviously there installing with the orbs like speaking back at us like all the time, um, so there is a kind of interesting pattern. Uh, what was interesting when we were installing is that suddenly one day. It, we got there in the morning, we were kind of weaving, weaving the, the conduit with the acrylic, and the ores basically were actually kind of transmitting information. It was like Libya, Benghazi, Benghazi, Libya, Libya, Benghazi. It was, and suddenly, basically, the entire installation was giving us information on something that we didn't know had actually happened, um, which was uh, the, the attack on the American embassy, right? So that suddenly, like for us, we're like, okay, one of them speaking, that is, you know, something's happening. But when all of them actually started kind of transmitting that information, we're like, okay, there's something there. So we pull out our phones, right? So suddenly there's that kind of other layer of like taking, you know, let's say the, the Grove was giving us a certain kind of information, and then we were taking that in, responding, looking it up, and trying to understand it. So that was, let's say, a pretty interesting not unexpected. I mean, you could have probably predicted it, but, um, but, but it was a kind of interesting moment for us to kind of understand, let's say, the kind of other layer uh, within this. Similar to various people who decided to talk back at it. Have you heard about Justin Bieber? And then they'd be like, no, I haven't. And then they'd be expecting the thing to actually kind of respond back at them. So there was a kind of really, for us, it was really interesting kind of observing people and how they would actually um, interact with it. Um, most would pull out a phone to kind of figure out what it was that was actually being transmitted. Half the time I didn't even know what it was because um, there were references that I wasn't familiar with. Um, so to kind of back up a little bit in terms of the actual kind of materiality of the piece, so you're seeing here the six jigs that we use to basically make the whole thing. So on the top you're seeing our acrylic jigs. So the acrylic tubing is basically bent. There's only three curves three, let's say, curved geometries that actually are able to make that entire, let's say, um, organization of acrylic. And similar for the conduit, there was three custom conduit bends that were used to, uh, to weave into that larger um, framework. So yes, it appears to be entirely customized and entirely like variable, but it's actually done using a, a smaller set of, um, of, of customized components. Um, another view into our office is we're kind of assembling um, the, the, let's say the tubing, but then also the kind of various iterations that we went through for the pods and, and the kind of vacuum forming processes that we tested out in order to, to figure out a way to actually kind of house the electronics in a watertight um, shell uh, with all the electronics kind of embedded within them. Um, here you're seeing Jonathan um, heating uh, an, a piece of acrylic into one of the jigs and sorting, labeling, tagging, a lot of that. Um, one of the kind of many fabrication layouts that we set up, there was a kind of a team of us working, so figuring out like how all of us could actually kind of participate in kind of assembling this kind of larger piece. 
um, and here a view into the um, into the grove and into the kind of series of orbs. Um, so the the next project, this this only two more projects because I want to leave enough time for us to um, to have any um, to answer any of your questions. Um, but the two last projects are literally hot off the press. Like I, I was laughing with Josh. I was, I was thinking that I haven't actually presented these to an architectural audience, so I'm kind of interested in hearing what you have to say. Um, but these are two projects. One is uh, one was just completed, and one um, is uh, fingers crossed. Uh, we're finalists in a proposal, so we're hopefully hoping that we actually move forward. But just to kind of um, show you something that's on our drawing boards and something that maybe just just happened. So. Um, so Light Swarm um, was a project that we did for the, um, that was installed about a month ago at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, uh, which for all of you who've seen like the various um, Apple announcements that happen out of San Francisco, this is, let's say, the museum piece that actually anchors the Moscone Center convention area. So it's right across the Daniel Liebeskin Museum, for those of you who are familiar with the city. Um, and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts is essentially an art museum. Um, which is, 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 has a, is a pretty kind of strong presence um, kind of at the urban level with, um, with San Francisco. So past these windows is basically a kind of large public courtyard space, um, public park space. Um, so the, so Light Swarm um, was a, a, a commission for an installation on the facade of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. So what you're seeing here is a kind of, um, I think it's about an 80 or 90 foot long kind of facade that's a couple of stories, um, a couple of stories tall, but only what was it, ten inches wide? <laughs> um, so kind of really long, thin, tall kind of area. That in the past YBCA has had murals and kind of wallpaper kind of patterns and kind of things like more as like window treatments essentially, kind of um, on the facade. Um, so they asked us to. Uh, um, to, to propose something that could actually be changeable, something that could be interactive, something that could evolve over time. Um, it's going to be up for two years. So it's something that actually has to kind of deal with, let's say, a kind of changing um, environment over time. Um, so for us, Light Swarm, just to kind of give you um, a little bit of the, the bigger idea, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let a video maybe tell you a little bit more about what it does. But the, so Light Swarm um, was really seen as an interface between inside and outside. Um, so it was understanding that on the one hand you have the kind of interior, let's say, more isolated, insular environment of a museum and a gallery, which is a, let's say, kind of enclosed, isolated environment. And on the other hand, you have like the city outside. Um, and those two worlds rarely meet. Um, they do when you walk through the doors, but then there is a kind of silence on the other end. Um, so we really kind of wanted to test that threshold, test that threshold between the quiet, kind of isolated gallery in the fully public kind of urban realm. And we saw our, our piece, our installation, basically occupying that like sliver of space. So how would we actually be able to take the city and, let's say, transmit it back into the gallery, or take the gallery and transmit that back out into the, into the city? Um, and what would that interface between those two environments actually, um, actually be? So the so Lightsworn basically takes in sound information from its two environments, the outside and the inside, um, and actually kind of creates a, a swarming a swarming algorithm. Basically, creates a pattern of lights on the facade that swarm towards that light source. Um, so um, this will hopefully show you instead of me talking at you about what it's supposed to do.
us, what was kind of really, let's say, compelling with this challenge was to actually figure out, on the one hand, predict only so much that we could then leave the rest for it to be whatever it turned out to be in the two years, right? So punk rock band was in there last weekend, and I got text messages saying, it's not doing anything. And I'm like, well, it's kind of hit its maximum at this point. There's a punk rock band on one side, and it's a Monday night outside. <laughs> it's not kind of. So you know, there's, there's certain, let's say, um, pieces to this that are highly, highly predictable, and certain other pieces that are completely unpredictable, to go back to a conversation we had um, earlier this afternoon, right? So I think for us, it's been interesting. As you probably could tell, we have a drop cam installed <laughs> in, in the gallery space, and we're actually able to kind of see what is actually kind of happening to the thing over time. We can record it. Um, it's, an, it's an art museum and a gallery. They hold a number of events in that space, so we're slowly you know, talking about um, uh, you know, we're, we're laughing about post-occupancy evaluation of some of this some of this thing, right? Like I don't know how people are going to end up using it or in kind of interacting with it. Um, but for us, it's also been a kind of interesting process of actually scaling up, right? So yes, I, you probably saw in the video each one of these are like individual modules that have been um, 3D printed. So certain parts, like the like the arms that are actually kind of suspended um, on these cables, are 3D printed. Uh, the shells are laser cut, and the LEDs are embedded in a kind of little carriage. I think there may be some zoom-ins later on, yeah. Um, the LEDs are basically embedded in a carriage um, that sits in each one of these shells, and it was a, it's a modular system, so it basically takes the bay of the window. Um, we're, we course our pattern, let's say, through it um, um, in order to kind of um, establish the kind of larger organization of the field, but then each module is able to kind of take in uh, different densities and different variations of, of units. And then there was three rotations that each one of these pieces was actually able to had a small, medium, large, and a 30, 60, 90, basically. And it's all happening through this kind of array of a certain set of modules kind of moving through it. Um, these were all kind of um, fabricated and, um, and assembled in our office. So here you're seeing all the arms sitting in their boxes, the electronics being tested. We had our main um, um, like our, um, electronic boards, the ones that were kind of embedded in each one of the modules, designed in-house and then kind of fabricated elsewhere. Um, and then we basically assembled the whole thing in our office. Like each module was just sitting. I mean, we didn't have the space to put them out as, as a single surface. We did it down the hallway, actually, for, for a bit until it took it was too distracting for everyone in the building. But, the, um, but we were able to basically test it um, as a kind of modular system in, a, in our space. Um, but we, of course, could never test it in an urban environment, right? Because it's this interface between the inside and the outside that we could do in our office in a certain kind of, we could test it in a kind of certain, let's say, environment, but we can actually kind of see what it would actually do ultimately in, um, um, at YBCA. Um, and because of just the way that we, we, we've kind of worked, the, the way the project has worked through is that we can remote tap into this. So we could change its color um, remotely. We can turn it on or off from our phones. We basically are able to kind of completely um, inter interact with it, let's say, and do let's, what would usually be a back end um, kind of, um, let's say, servicing or maintenance of the thing. So we've been testing out different colors. We've been testing out different intensities different delays or different swarm algorithms to basically kind of move through. So although technically YBCA you know, has, their, has the project as they asked us to deliver it, for us it's a constant tweaking. We can actually kind of reprogram it and kind of test things entirely different kind of um, throughout. Um, and it's been a kind of interesting way to, to also see how people um, interact with it, because most of it is pretty up high, but there's a certain kind of portion of it that's actually on the ground. So you have people like on either side of the glass communicating to one another, trying to figure out how to trigger the different like uh, sound sensors. Either by clapping seems to be tapping on the window, but I think the the guards have stopped that one. But there's um, there's these kind of other mechanisms that people are basically trying to trigger trigger the thing to perform for them, um, and um, and it's been kind of uh, interesting to see how that um, plays out. So the the last kind of uh, in the next of minutes that I have left. Um, the last uh, kind of piece to this, um, the piece that I wanted to show you is uh, a um, proposal. So for all, for all of these projects that you guys see, we submit usually RFQs, like what would typically be an RFQ and an RFP. Um, 
We submit to a lot of art um, opportunities, so public art opportunities. That's where a lot of our, let's say, commissions and, and projects are actually coming from. Even with Light Swarm, the, the previous project, that was a, a call, a public call for proposals. Um, and in this case, we're part of a, um, we submitted um, uh, qualifications and proposals for Lightweave, which is a, uh, for, for NOMA, that's the name of the kind of larger competition, which was a, um, a series of proposals for four underpasses north of Union Station in Washington, D.C. So Union Station, big train station, number of train tracks kind of landing right into the city and maybe a few trickling out, but Washington, D.C. Is, is a pretty big hub. Um, and there's a series of underpasses that basically um, exist because the tracks cut, obviously, one side um, over the other. So, um, so the underpasses were seen as places for artwork to exist, like put a piece of art and everything will, it, it'll all work out in the end. Um, but, but ultimately, I think for us, it was more of like trying to figure out how something that occupies these underpasses could actually stitch two radically different neighborhoods together. So on the one hand, um, I don't even know if I put a site plan up here, but, but on the one hand, you basically have a highly a residential neighborhood, and on the other hand, you have like, um, NPR, new plazas, it's a kind of uh, new up and coming kind of area for Washington DC. So how do these underpasses actually kind of weave um, these two worlds um, and how do they become, let's say, part of the, part of the fabric? So um, we, we kind of submitted a, a, a proposal that basically kind of looked at light as being the thing that could actually weave these two sides of this kind of um, underpass. So, um, really kind of um, starting to take some cues from some of our previous projects. There's obviously data grove undertones to this. Um, so, and, and we totally, you know, we, we're totally interested in kind of taking something that we've done before, mastering it, and like actually kind of trying it out at a different scale with a different set of materials, making it more robust, because this is a permanent installation. Um, so really kind of looking at this, let's say, woven light as, as being the thing that could connect one side of the underpass to the other, provide light, which was part of the, let's say, call, um, and, and also, let's say, create a kind of really interesting space to actually move through. Um, so here you're seeing the kind of two sides. It's kind of where Amtrak and Metro, um, Metro kind of come together, um, and there's a kind of very distinct grain from one side um, to the other. Um, and then our proposal basically looked at these kind of woven structures suspended up above. Actually, not suspended because we're not allowed to touch. We're not allowed to touch the tracks above because those are owned by Amtrak or Metro, depending on which part of the track you're touching. You're not allowed to touch the walls. You're not allowed to touch. Um, you're not allowed to suspend anything. Everything has to happen from the ground up. So the proposal can only touch the ground. It can't touch anything else in that underpass which was a kind of interesting challenge for us. We were like, okay, this, how do they think we're all gonna do this? Um, but it actually ended up really kind of um, setting up a lot of the parameters for the rest of the project to basically become this almost like cloud that's suspended um, in, the, in the underpass space as you kind of move through. And that these clouds could be constantly kind of modulating and changing relative to the kind of incoming train. So if you lived in that neighborhood, you'd be able to read the installation as to how far the train is and whether you need to run to get to the train station. Not Union Station, but like the, the metro station. Or you know, how far away the, the next kind of um, incoming Amtrak train is. So on the one hand, it was a, an, a, a public art piece that actually lights the ground, provides a safe environment, um, is interesting, hopefully, for one to see. But it also uh, becomes part of like indexing a kind of urban information into um, um, into the urban realm. Um, and here's a view kind of into, um, in the tunnel across, let's say, the uh, four lanes of traffic that cut through it, um, and then a kind of view into the, um, into the tunnel out um, to the other side. Um, and for us, like similar, let's say, to, to kind of um, to Light Swarm, so the, the previous project, there's this kind of idea of being able to install something in a, in a urban environment, test it for what's happening, but then also be able to redeploy it. So we would potentially be able to change color, change ambience, change, um, change certain kind of rhythms throughout this. So yes, it's a kind of permanent installation, but there is potentially a way to actually program difference over time uh, and embed that within it. And for us, that seemed to be a kind of interesting way to 
take some of those initial ideas about you know, how does a building respond to its surrounding environment? How does it actually kind of exist in reciprocal relationship to the things that surround it? And in this case, actually start looking at that as something that could evolve over time. It could be something that maybe we need to reprogram over time. Um, but at basically taking those kind of similar ideas of that kind of feedback loop between the things that we design and build and the things that surround us and kind of test it out both at the speculative layer and also at the, um, at the prototypical layer. So thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, please. Even from the ones who I've already spoken to. Sasha, is that right? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, thanks a lot for the presentation, and again, dealing with me one more time. But I was wondering, uh, one of the things that you were mentioning was designing post-design, and I find that really fascinating, especially if we don't think of architecture in a permanent state or a finished state. What do you think are the things that we should do to allow that? Because um, at this level, it mainly seems to be in the, the fabric of the code of the architecture. But where else, to be, where else can we allow these systems to enable us to continuously design and hence adapt it to the changes that occur and so forth? Mm -hmm. No, it's an interesting kind of question because for us the thing that tripped us up a little bit with the last couple of installations is like how do you actually, I know it seems really boring so bear with me until I can think this through, but like how do you like write a contract <laughs> that actually says, okay, this is the piece, you've been delivered this thing, but you know, there's a maintenance plan kind of attached to it. And there's like layers of, you know, who do you call should the thing break? Or if we decide to reprogram it, when are we allowed to reprogram it? Versus, you know, so, so in this case, the last, these scenarios for us have been like really, let's say ad hoc, and it just happens that it's a curator who we've worked with and you know they're interested in testing this out so there's a like an open-ended let's say aspect to it uh, but your question is 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 well taken just in terms of you know I don't really know how that translates into um, kind of larger building scale I mean I you know you you could argue that our buildings already do that right they calibrate for temperature it's really cold outside you know there's there's let's say sensor driven mechanisms that already do that to a certain extent but I think we're interested in it being kind of a much more spatial, uh, let's say, transformation, be it through light or sound, um, ultimately maybe through form or shape change, I don't know. Um, but that, the, that there are um, other mechanisms to, to set that in place. And I think, um, I don't think it's a, it's, a straightforward, um, it's a straightforward problem, but I think slowly kind of making inroads in this territory, I think will slowly, you know, at least get us talking about it. Oh, sorry. On the Lightweave project, um, what sort of light source did you use for the lighting portion of it? Is kind of my question. On Lightweave, so, so the last project. The last one. Okay, yeah. so that's interesting because up until now we've basically been like customizing our own LEDs to basically do the the illuminating illuminating kind of layer. Or uh, with Data Grove, it was um, it was a kind of ambient light um, with um, with Lightweave, because it's also a permanent installation, we've been looking at LED tubing. You've probably all seen it, like under handrails <laughs> and under, um, in airports probably, uh, running kind of long hallways. So it's a pretty, I wouldn't say it's a typical product, but we're actually kind of looking at taking an existing product um, and talking to, we actually just met with, um, some of the manufacturers to see, okay, is it something that you'd be willing to try out as to how to shape, you know, change its shape, change its form. They're already doing a lot of it, but they're doing it like for, for squiggles on the ceiling, like as you're walking down like some airport concourse. Um, so we're trying to kind of figure out like if we could use those logics to actually kind of, um, um, let's say, hijack them a little bit um, and, and, and do what we would like with them. So we're, we're um, but, but it's probably the first time we're actually talking with, let's say, a manufacturer to actually kind of work through their process to see how we could do this. Because it is a permanent 
um, installation, it would need to have obviously the certain warranties that it would need in order to, to exist. Um, I know you mentioned that uh, you were collaborating with different fields, uh, like graphic designers, and you're working with electronics. In your new installations and your new projects looking forward, um, are there any fields that you're looking into that you're interested in working with, like biology or the sciences or like aerospace, engineering, anything like that? Mm -hmm. um, I'd say we'd be interested in the kind of biological sciences. We don't necessarily have a kind of, we've, we've actually tapped into, so a couple of our projects have had, um, like the Theater of Lost Species, which was actually the first slide, that green thing that you guys were probably looking at while, before the lecture started. Um, that was something where we actually worked with um, paleobiologists on. So uh, basically biologists who are interested in the history of species and their species extinction. Um, so we're working with them. Uh, the Theater of Lost Species was a, is a proposal for a, a theater that you'd kind of um, look into and actually see um, a virtual, let's say, fish tank of species long extinct. Um, so in that case, we worked with them. I think your question is maybe more, let's say, um, I guess, as kind of design influences. Um, we worked with a NASA engineer from, uh, for Hydromax, so working with a shape memory alloy. Those are motors that actually he has patented. Um, and he was willing to kind of work with us to figure out how to make this crazy thing that does, has feathers on, in the sky, right? So. Um, he was super open-minded about all strange things that we brought to the table. So we've, we've started working with people on the kind of engineering side. I, I don't know, we haven't got any particular partnerships right now with the kind of um, biological sciences. Um, but I do know that that's obviously something that's, that's happening right now. There's a number of young practices that are doing a lot of that work. Um, Blue Klein, Terraform, you know, there's, there's a kind of really interesting, let's say, conversation that's happening about uh, the relationship between biotech material making, material composition, and, um, and let's say form generation. So I think it's a really interesting field. So the reason we are not doing it is not because we would want to. I mean, there, um, I think there's people out there who are doing some really interesting, interesting work on that. Uh, so I think it's great that uh, you, uh, some of your built or building scale uh, speculative works, um, you're working out the details um, and putting it out in like places like MoMA uh, so that you show people how these uh, buildings would work and how they could possibly be built. Um, do you think that it's reaching uh, like the right people though, like, uh, like our contractors who like maybe end up having to build these things so that your speculative work maybe someday is less speculative and moves into a physical realm? I mean, particularly with Hydromax as a project, that wasn't part of the, that was not, I mean, I'm just going to be honest, it wasn't part of the conversation. Like, it was definitely seen as a kind of, not, not a rhetorical project in that it didn't want debate, but it was definitely kind of seen as something that we were just kind of putting out there and, and basically kind of being part of that conversation. Um, with a lot of, um, I mean, as of more recently, with let's say more of the kind of installation work that we're doing, we're definitely kind of talking to people who are in the industry, but the industry, like in our, let's say, mindset is talking to like the LED people who we are now hopefully going to ask them to like take what they've done for centuries, and, or not centuries, a couple of years. Um, but let's say an established field is per their eyes and actually kind of turn that on its head, or working with um, Chrysler and associates who are, you know, started off as boat builders and now are doing the facade of, like, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art out of, um, um, that Snow had a design, right? So, so we're working, we're really interested in working with contractors, let's say, but we're, um, and we've always kind of brought them in at the kind of beginnings of, of project development. Um, they're always a kind of integral part in a lot of that conversation. Um, what's been interesting with the last project that I showed, um, Lightweave, is that that's, um, it's obviously, it's, it's a much more involved project because it has a completely different set of constituencies. It's urban, it's in Washington, 
It's under a train track. It's owned by the city. So we've actually kind of entered, let's say, a more typical um, design process. So we have an architect of record licensed in DC. We have a fabricator and a, you know, basically suddenly we're, we're trying to basically take our process and find a way to actually make it work within a more typical like public art being built in city kind of way. So I'll let you know next time how that works out, if we get the project, so we'll see. My question is kind of going off of his, because uh, it deals a lot, because um, you do a lot with like things that you want to have in there, like the Hydromax or transforming or uh, sea level rise or like with the, the project underneath the bridge, like what if you could do this? Um, and so I, my question kind of concerns how you're speaking of utopia. And the concept's fascinating. It has different images in all of our heads. Um, um, yet, like, we're rarely ever able to completely realize these things in life. Um, and so a lot of us resort to like animation or sci-fi rendering or like going into you know, Comic-Con and saying, what if life was like this? Um, so my question is kind of like, what would be your ideal trajectory for uh, future cities? Like, as many of us want to be utopian and have these ideas of like what the future could be like, how does that kind of direct what you do with your work? Because there's a little voice in the back of our head that says like we can't ever live on the moon right now, at least for our lifetimes and stuff like that. Like, how does that influence? You know? Um. I mean, I think, I mean, I, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the, I think the role of speculation is, is really critical. Um, and, you know, you were, I think, mentioning earlier Archigram and, you know, things that have like a lasting influence in, in a lot of the discourse that we have. And the majority of those are speculative utopian, let's say, proposals. I think for us, a kind of really um, important aspect of a lot of, let's say, the more speculative work is that there's always a hook in reality. And we find that as a kind of really important <laughs> way and the way, an important part in the way that we actually develop these kind of um, projects because like even with Hydromax, yes, it's a peer system, it's working off an existing, let's say, aquaponics loop, like there's certain things that are, let's say, that you could say exist out there, but they just haven't been reconsidered in this particular way. So for us, um, let's say the more utopian projects are there um, for a reason because they kind of push us to think further and kind of push the boundaries. Um, but I think they also um, allow us to maybe speculate in a way that isn't that far ahead, I would like to think, um, in, in the future where you know our buildings could sense certain things and they could respond in certain ways. Maybe you won't have a robot hanging upside down in your living room, but you know some, some aspects of it, well, maybe you can if Andrew's in charge. But I think that's like, you know, a, a, a piece of this is, you know, certain things in those, let's say, renderings and those kind of images for us are things that are, um, are possible. I don't think they're highly impossible. So there's a difference between, like, atopia, utopia, and a dystopia. Like, the, the nuances between those three, I think, are, are, are pretty important. Any other? Okay, well, uh, looks like uh, it is time to wrap up, but uh, you're welcome to interact uh, with Natalie after the uh, talk. Uh, thank you all uh, for uh, coming and uh, wonderful questions and conversations. And thank you, Natalie, for uh, visiting us. Thanks uh, for having me. Leaving all the wonderful weather behind. Thank you.